We're going to begin with Ms. Noonan. When you picked up the papers, the first thing your eye went to today was what? Oh, the headlines on the front of the Washington Post for it was the first newspaper I picked up <laughs> staying at my hotel. But the first thing that really, uh, I, I think, uh, caught my attention was uh, the Charles Krauthammer column on Iraq and what he thinks are, are, are the problems surrounding the administration's, uh, the Clinton administration's presentation of the war so far. He thinks it's rather um, somewhat acerbic column, I think, in which he talks about uh, the lack of an element of surprise, et cetera, and the whole thing. Did yeah. you watch that? Event? Yes, I did. I watched it live, I, I, and I was fascinated by it in a lot of ways, but I, this is the only point in which I disagree with Krauthammer. President Clinton the other day, when he essentially reiterated and recapitulated um, his views with regard to uh, Saddam Hussein and, and uh, his his plans to the extent that he revealed those plans, um, look, his tones were were measured and and in some ways perhaps low key, but that is not inappropriate. I mean, this is a man talking about the possibility of the use of a. Uh, of uh, U.S. force against another country. Uh, I'm not sure passion and pounding the pulpit is a really good idea uh, when that's the topic. What's another piece from you? I'll take oh, Mr. gosh, interesting away. stuff. The uh, USA Today has a uh, front page below the fold, Clinton now isolated from staff, comma, nation. It's a story by Susan Page and Bill uh, Nichols. Uh, it's, it's below the fold, and it's just a little box on the front page here, but the jump uh, on the next page is really almost half the second page, and it has lots of kind of White House inside dope gossip about, uh, look at how big this is, about how the president uh, in his, his um, latest crisis is, is receding a little bit, pulling back a little bit, not being quite as public as he has been in the past uh, with regard to talking to reporters and being really out there, but even uh, to uh, to the extent of not being with his staff quite as much. Um, uh, that, you know what, it reminded me of Nixon during Watergate when you started seeing the same stories. Uh, it's, uh, that's always kind of interesting and kind of sad when a president pulls himself in like that. Mr. Sapphire was one of the great speech writers, and, and look, he is a wonderful, uh, he's a wonderful writer, and when he says essentially, uh, uh, support Clinton because he may do better with our support as opposed to support Clinton because he's right and he's doing the right thing and we're really behind him. This is not by accident that he's saying this. This is what he thinks. Um, and there's there's no wordsmith in that. You know? How about the president's legal defense fund? Because we haven't talked about that yet. Oh, I, he has to have one. I, in in the climate that's been in place for the past 30 years, I, I, it seems to me he, he has got to be able to pay for his lawyers. He cannot get legal advice for free, so he has to get people to, to, uh, to, to uh, contribute to it. I, I don't really see any way around that. I don't find that we've blurred the lines, that journalism has blurred the lines, but there is a constant cacophony, is that how you say that word? You know, in, in the age of all media, of television monitors all over, and radio all over, and, and the sound of our culture, and the news machine pumping out information, do things get confused and, and can the lines seem sometimes to be blurred? Sure, that's just because there's media all over the place, particularly with a story like this. Uh, it seems to me. You know where I think Lewinsky and Iraq sort of intersect as a story? And Tara, tell me if this was unusual. The other day when the president spoke about Iraq from the Pentagon, not from the Oval Office, but from the Pentagon, uh, before an audience of uh, military men and women, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs was the first gentleman to speak at that event. And he did essentially a two-minute commercial for Bill Clinton and Bill Cohen. Then Bill Cohen, the Secretary of Defense, comes on and does essentially a two-minute commercial for Bill Clinton and Al Gore. And Al Gore comes on and does essentially a two-minute commercial for uh, the President's top staff and for Bill Clinton. And only then did Bill Clinton come on and do essentially for a minute a commercial about all of the people he has behind him. It seemed that was highly unusual. I'd never seen anything like that. And yeah. I thought, this is the first 10 minutes of this really important event that is being broadcast live all over the country. I think what they're trying to say is, 
in spite of the recent stories, in spite of the sometimes antic-seeming nature of this administration, we really are adults. We really have thought this through. We have talked with each other. We're together. The military is with us, the defense structure. Your political leaders, we're all together on this. And you can trust us. I had never seen, I think, in my lifetime, an American president think he had to make those statements and assertions, uh, both symbolically and rather directly. Yeah, I considered that fascinating when I watched it. I watched uh, not the entire town meeting, but uh, sections of it. Um, sometimes the American people just stun me, and they stunned me, uh, those folks in Ohio, uh, yesterday. Um, for one thing, you know, you spend 40, 50 years watching Ted Koppel and Barbara Walters and Walter Cronkite ask probing questions. You absorb the ability to ask probing questions without your even knowing it. And you can stand up and pin down a Secretary of Defense. Um, that's one thing that, that was kind of startling and very interesting. The other is that we can all, we are of an age where we can remember when we were kids, a certain uh, shyness perhaps on the part of the American people or a sort of assumption that our leaders, if you will, actually may know a few things that we don't know and have information, data that we can't balance. And so there was a certain respect that we brought to them inevitably and not inappropriately, I think. That's gone. It's been going for a long time, but when you looked at the tape of Ohio yesterday, you can see that is so gone. The people in that audience did not think Madeleine Albright had any more insight or intelligence or data than they did. You can really see its full fruits these days. I don't mean I discovered it the other day, but in the 90s, yeah, <laughs> you know? Uh, could I point out, though, look, the, the one refreshing or, or bracing thing about uh, Ohio is that it is always very good before a war to see people, before a military action, to see people question it and, and really take it very serious. That's marvelous. There is also the, I love the uh, Walt Whitman, the barbaric yawp of democracy. I love to see people stand up and make a fuss and make their case. That having been said, uh, we are still in agreement about a, a certain new tear in the dialogue that, you know, I was thinking as that question came in, can I, can I add something to his comment and or question? I don't fully understand. I know that there are serious laws for fear, serious reasons against a U.S. government agency attempts to assassinate foreign leaders. We all know that. But we also all know that Saddam himself is the problem here. He's the problem. It, if you take a military action aimed at least in part in taking out the person of Saddam Hussein, that of course is legal. Uh, why can't that be done? Why is not that done? Why do people feel that, that he uh, can hide anywhere, that he can endlessly frustrate American attempts to get to him? Does he live five miles under the ground or something? What the heck is the story with him? Not just that, but it, it, look, there have been little monsters of history. One was Hitler, one was Stalin. If they'd been taken out, one can assume that history would have turned out better for tens of millions of people. So I, I, so while I'm sympathetic to yes, but who would fill the vacuum and who would take his place, I can't help but think one of the answers would be, well, not as bad a guy as him. <laughs> you know? I wonder about it. I don't really understand this. Oh, Lord. Well, look, on the, on the part about uh, administration, uh, Mrs. Albright now uh, and, and Mr. Berger, I think they're trying to play down what happened yesterday in Ohio. Of course they are. I mean, it's, I, I think after you've been through something like that, it rocks you a little bit. And uh, it, it's like talking about terrible turbulence after an airplane flight. You say, oh, boy, that was interesting. That was fun, mm. <laughs> you know? But of course it wasn't at the moment. But you survived. I hope somebody looks. I, I hope there are journalists today trying to track down the members of that audience. Uh, it, it's very interesting to me. There was a whole mix of people from, from leftists who, who, who seem to view this uh, Clinton plans on Iraq as part of a capitalist conspiracy regarding oil to, to pro-Palestinian anti-Israeli. Uh, groups who were there. I'm just very curious about who was there, why they were there, how they got there. You know what point. I've been thinking about in the pa for about the past day and a half, too, as I've heard people debate the whole Iraq thing? Um, 
It seems to me that members of the American Armed Forces themselves, uh, not only the folks who will move if movement is called for in Iraq, uh, but those behind the lines, more than ever members of the American Armed Forces have within them their own foreign policy and their own views and their own sense of what's right and what's wrong. I sense less followership in the armed forces than I used to. You know, there's leaders, there's followers, there are members of the armed forces. Somebody says, jump out of a plane, you jump out of a plane. Uh, that's the way you imagine the military, and perhaps to a degree that's more the way the military used to be than it is now. I was very struck last time when Iraq was in the news in the in with regard to US force in the uh, in the Gulf War there were so many members of the armed forces who were at staging areas about to be sent over to Iraq and they were giving interviews to local TV uh, and radio stations and they fascinated me by saying now if Bush does this and this I will support him but if he takes this view I can tell you that I and the other members of my troop are gonna hold back on this and I was fascinated by this it was democracy but in our armed forces we don't really want quite as much democracy as we want on your street corner. I see, once again, I am seeing that, uh, it seems to me, on the Iraq story. Yes, they've really enjoyed getting out there with their microphones and talking to the people. Uh, you know, Clinton loves that, and I think it's come back to bite him. Um, you know, I once asked Senator Kerry, I once met up with him at one of the conventions, uh, at, at uh, the Democratic Convention in 96, as a matter of fact, and I said to him, was that true? Did you say of Clinton years ago, he is not just a liar, he's an unusually good liar? And he looked at me and he said, yes. And I said, wow, did that get you in trouble? <laughs> Meaning with the president. And he smiled as in, duh. <laughs> um, uh, look, I, I think I, I think I addressed uh, my views on, on what the caller said uh, with regard to the president's Pentagon speech the other day already. Uh, I, I, I think that's why the commercials, as I put it in the beginning, uh, by the gentleman who spoke at the Pentagon before the president and then the president himself, that's why the commercials took place. They were trying to get past these, this recent scandal and, and doing the best they could on that. Tara? You know what, maybe we're coming back to that point of view. Maybe we left it about 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, and maybe there's something to it. Mm. It's okay with me. I'll tell you, that didn't offend me when he said that. <laughs> I thought, didn't yeah, offend yeah, me you, Yeah, you're probably right. It probably is our job. It has been in the past. That's not so bad. Hey, could I ask a question about Iraq? The, the, the talk from the administration, Give me insight on this. The talk that seems to be coming from the administration, from the White House or from the Pentagon, on the future timing of a potential move against Iraq and the targets of a potential move against Iraq, they take me aback. Charles Krauthammer wrote his column in part about why are we doing this? Why are we telling them our plans? Why are we letting out all this stuff? This, uh, to say the least, reduces the element of surprise. Is this deliberate, leaking all this stuff, as in telling Saddam, we're going to do this, you know, we really mean it? Or is this the messiness of such projects? Or is this a particular messiness on the part of this White House? Yeah, well, uh, look, parts of it are inescapably public and should be public. This is not exactly uh, December 7th, 1941. You know, it's not exactly a sneak attack. That having been said, I am taken aback to the extent to which we're saying, and by the way, we're coming Thursday to 23rd and Vine, which seems to me uh, extraordinary and, and gives one pause. Yeah. There tends to be, with the Clinton statements, very little intellectual shelf life. Um, audiences who enjoy his performances walk away wondering, uh, if you ask them, uh, will we'll rather clearly say, well, I don't really know what he said. He said, things are getting better. And you say, yeah, anything more than that? Well, I don't know. Um, I think that's a problem with Mr. Clinton. He, uh, he is actually uh, endlessly fascinating to me as a speaker because he is, he is uh, verbal and articulate without being eloquent ever. And he, he does, as I say in the book, he speaks, uh, particularly when he's on the stump uh, without a, a script, he speaks uh, in a way that is in, th that shows real intensity. He almost has the intensity uh, of an intellectual without the thoughts of an intellectual, it seems to me. Um, and yet most people tell you, well, he's pretty good. 
You know, so it's funny. There's a, it, it, it seems to me that there's a lack of, uh, of a striking and interesting quality in his, in his uh, statements. And yet it seems to work in its own limited way, I think.